Charlie Hunter. Mason. Thank you so much for being here today. That Thanks was the amazing Spanish joint by D'Angelo off the Voodoo album, year 2000. Although, as you told me, it was not recorded anywhere close to 2000. No, I mean, closer to 2000 than like 100 AD. Sure. It was, <laughs> it was 1997. That, right. that was when I was in the studio for the short time I was there. And you did two songs on that that record. Yeah, and I think I, there's a f maybe a fragment of another one or something like that on there. I think so. So three songs potentially. Ish. Uh, three yeah. ish. Two and a half. Ish. Yeah. And I have to say, I mean, for for many guitar players, this is sort of a seminal album. I remember waiting in line at Amoeba Records to get this. There wow. was so much hype <laughs> around this record. I remember there was a long line. It was like waiting in line for like Jordans to release sort of thing. Oh, okay. There was tons of people. Everybody was very excited. And I just remember being completely mesmerized by by the guitar. I had no idea who you were at that point. I just remember like whoever I, the bass player was, I thought was incredibly funky. Whoever the guitar player was, I thought was incredibly funky. Oh. I didn't realize it was the same guy. Oh, wow. At the same time. Ah. <laughs> So I it, did my best. It's an honor to to have you play that, but I'm really curious from selfishly and and for all the other guitar players out there, like what was this session like? Like this was at Electric Lady Studios, yep, correct? Yep. And you were 30 years old. Yep. Yep. And if my math is correct. How how did how did you get the call for the session? How did this come about? Okay. Give me some context for this. Well, you know, back then, you know, this is before really, I mean, people had laptops, some, but not many. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it was before, obviously, really any of the smartphones, YouTube, any of this, these things. So content, content wasn't even really a word, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but there was... Um, was cable TV was one of the ways you got at, got out there, and BET. Whoever the folks at BET were were very smart. They they started this thing called Bet on Jazz, mm -hmm. um, but they didn't have because I guess they had a cable. I don't a channel. I don't know how yeah. it worked, but they didn't have a ton of content. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did a thing there with my group at the time with Scott Amendola on drums and Dave Ellis on tenor, mm -hmm. and it just. If you're if you're flipping through the channels at night in your hotel or whatever, it would play a lot because they didn't have a lot of content, so they just play the same thing over again. <laughs> and I guess D'Angelo told me he saw that, uh, and then reached out to me yeah. after that. So that's how I got on his radar. Okay. I think you know. And okay. then he, I mean, he he was like, um, or see, when I met those guys, I just was astonished. I mean, not astonished because, you know, he just was he. I didn't have a ton of music out there at the time. I mean, I had not even been playing that instrument very long, a mm. couple years really mm. at that point. But I had a few records out on Blue Note and a, another record, and he literally had everything that I put out. I had listened to everything too. It was making comments on specific tracks and mm. specific chord chains. I was like, wow, this guy's like really like a serious brainiac mm -hmm. and like a total, like you did that much research, man. I right. can't believe that. I'm right. getting uncomfortable, you know? <laughs> um, Were you familiar with his music at all before he had reached out to you? Like Brown Sugar was the yeah, first Yeah, I remember that record being out. Um, but honestly, we were touring so much um, with my band at the time. Uh, we were touring like constantly between that and all the other stuff because being on Blue Note and releasing records. So I wasn't that 
tuned into everything that was going yeah. on. But I do remember that record. You yeah. Know? Well, it, it was it, uh, I guess, because there was like a three year gap between the time that you recorded and it came out. Did you have any sense of like, what was being built on that record would become such like a huge a huge thing. I know that it, it was huge for a lot of different reasons. Like musically, it was incredible. I think in terms of popular culture, it also hit a mm. nerve because of the music video with the 360 degree camera and yeah. D'Angelo Sands clothing. Uh, right. And it, maybe it brought an unwanted element to, that, that sort of distracted from the music. But But that aside, did you have any sense of like, wow, this stuff is really great, or this is going to be huge, or was it just kind of like... Not really. I didn't... It just was not part of my thing. At one point, I think he a asked if I would like to be in his band, which I was really flattered, but I had my own career going. I had all yeah. these people depending on me, and um, I had to keep that going, you know right. what I mean? So I didn't get that opportunity. I, I guess I passed on it. Um, but so, you know, I just, like I said, I was so busy in my own universe. I, I really didn't have an idea of it, but, um, but, you know, and I don't, I don't know how popular it was when it came out. I think it was popular, Yeah. but I think as time went on, it became more popular. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think, I think sort of my impression of it was that because of that music video, which, you know, is, is sort of the, the cover is sort of emblematic of, and, and, and the music video kind of has a similar mm. dressed in, a, gotcha. in, in this birthday suit. I think that it brought a lot of attention publicly because it was, it was provocative in the way that it was shot. Right, and of course, right. you know, he's really shredded and lean and, and, and looks amazing. See, I think I've only seen a picture. I don't think I've seen that video. It, and so I think it, it I think that maybe musically it, it, it distracted from that some because I like see. people were just like, well, this guy's like shredded yeah. and, and you know, seeing his yeah. butt off. But then I think as time went on. never had that problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time. Can... Either being shredded or seeing my butt off. Neither of those things is a problem for me. Before we started filming, I was asking you about, you know, just like the session. You're like, oh, man, for me, it was just like a Wednesday. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't mean that in a blasé way. Those guys were incredible and definitely kick, kicked my butt around the block a few times for sure. Um, and it was a great experience to get to be in their universe for a few days. Um, learned a lot, you know. Um, but, you know, we were so you're at that time, you're, you know, late 20s, early 30s, you're just so busy all the time. Mm -hmm. Everything is by the seat of your pants. Sure. You're, I mean, I probably maybe I probably went right into the studio on two hours of sleep. And yeah. when we record, probably when we recorded that, I mean, you, you never know, you're just always just boom, 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 because that's kind of the tempo that you yeah. kind of have to go at. Yeah. So, you know, and maybe it's better that I didn't have any chance to think about it beforehand because I probably would have been like, whoa, yeah, right. what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. Do you, and was that all recorded live? Like, were you in the room with, yeah. with D'Angelo and Questlove and... Yeah, I mean, that song... Roy Hargrove, was he in the Roy room? Roy was not there. Okay. Um, it was just me and D'Angelo and, and Amir were okay. in the... And Amir was in a little drum booth. And I remember we had to keep taking breaks because breaks there was no ventilation in there oh wow you know so yeah i think he had to keep taking because it's just like I, I need to breathe at some point was it was it know? summertime when you recorded Do you remember it, it was, must have been okay yeah it must have been um but yeah we just recorded and i think that song was just one take yeah i mean maybe that was the second take or the yeah. first take but we certainly didn't dither around too much with it what about you know? for the the root the other song that we're going to explore today was that like a similar thing like same same personnel in the room yeah it's just the three of us and and was that one take something like that i don't i can't remember it may have been you know i think we were that root thing was something that i had done up and this is weird because this guitar is like it's in it's in a different key right but um so you're using an eight string at that time yeah i was using an eight string um which was ill-advised young thing yeah. but you know i've got this guitar and then all of a sudden i have a career and i'm like well i i can barely play this what am i doing yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I just, I can't thank you enough. I know you haven't listened to it and maybe, oh, you, I think that people... In, that's why in, I messed up the form. I'm like, wait, <laughs> how many bars was that just now? <laughs> well, it is a little bit of an odd, like, it's it's not intuitive necessarily if you're if you're not familiar with playing it. And this is the first time yeah. you've kind of revisited it yeah. in, what, 20 something well, years? Well, I, I did a record with a great organist in from Greensboro named Sam Freibush, but I was just playing regular old guitar on it. And uh -huh. then we just had an arrangement, so... Okay. 
But this, I have a feeling that what ended up, ha what was happening there was because we were all really in the same room. It was just an eye contact thing yeah. and he just cued it when yeah. it felt like it was the right time. Okay. And then we just did it. I imagine that's yeah. what happened. And, and no, cl no click track to that? Not that I remember. Okay. I don't think so, no. Okay. Wow, that's, that's uh, it's incredible. In terms of gear, so you had your eight string guitar at the time. Yep. And then, uh, do you remember what kind of amp you were using? <sighs> I think, I, for some reason, I think it was a Fender Twin. Okay. And probably it was uh, the original one that... Like the, the, the mid-60s kind of... No, it was it had the, the silver... Oh, the silver face vibe. twin. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so 70s. So probably they bought it new and it just yeah, sat just, there. Yeah, just stayed there at Electric know? Lady. Yeah. And, and then were you going direct for the bass or was that... Most a likely okay. direct. Okay. I'm not sure. Yeah. I have to ask Russ Elevato. Right. Know. Well, we can, we can, uh, he's still around. We can talk to oh, him. Oh, yeah. He's ask, still ask around. He's still just as amazing as ever. Yeah. yeah. He's, uh, he's, he's an analog OG for sure. But yep. Yep. No <laughs> doubt. Don't try to make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, we, ta we talked about Spanish Joint. We've talked about the session. Yeah. Um, I could spend all day just talking to you about this. And, oh, and that's it's okay. Our, you know, it's, it it's, doesn't it's, bother it's, me. Uh, it's amazing. I'd love to hear the root if you're willing to. To kind of go through sure. and explore a little bit of your part on there. I know it's not the same guitar, so yeah. we're making you do a little homework here and figuring this out. We will get right back to our interview with Charlie, but first I want to talk to you about one of our sponsors that makes these interviews possible, our friends over at Neural DSP. And today, some of the sounds that you're hearing are using two of their plugins from the Corey Wong package, one of which is the clean machine amplifier for the guitar side, and the other is their bass DI, and a little bit of slapback delay from the delay preset. So please do check out our friends over at Neural DSP. They offer all of our viewers 30% off any of the plugins that they desire, except for new releases, which will be available after 90 days. Use the coupon code VERTEX, V-E-R-T-E-X, at checkout and get 30% off any plugin of your choosing. Now back to the interview. It's so good. Oh, thank you. It's a little weird because originally, so this instrument is G, C, F, C, F, B flat. That A string was like E, A, D, A, D, G, B, E. Uh -huh. But it was really hard to, I mean, I was trying to pack way too much into one yep. instrument and just like much harder to play and the shorter scale length and with a low E, it's just like, oh my God. So when you got to, for like for that song, for example, did he have like a chord chart that he was giving no. you or were you just like listening in the room or was like, no, I wrote how did they that. feel out? You wrote it. Yeah, in the hotel room. I remember I was just, it was something I was just messing with. Uh -huh. and, you know, probably watching sports on TV or something, uh -huh. then I was just noodling with that. Or. So it's so specific. Uh, that's a long story. All right. Well, we won't go into it. A that. long story with very little money. <laughs> so it's. And if you think about it. It's, it's really something that really lends itself to the right. hybrid, right? Uh -huh. Then I was just like... Spanish joint or after that you came up with this or like you had come up with it before you even started the session 
Yeah, before we even started the session, and I I remember going in there one of the days. Was like, I don't remember what when it comes chronologically with hey. whatever, but I just remember like, oh yeah, this is a cool thing. I just came up with this nice little groove. Uh, and then there's yeah. like, oh let's let's make let's make some out of yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And then we just recorded that, and we I think we probably cycled it a bunch, and I'm assuming probably because the other thing was when I finished this i remember we had a cassette they gave us just like here here's a cassette of what you guys did you yeah. know and there was a lot of stuff on it too yeah. it wasn't i have no idea where that cassette is it's probably sadly in a landfill somewhere okay but um i remember playing it for some friends and they're like oh this is killing but he during the thing d'angelo was really into um i guess what later people would understand to be kind of a Jay Dilla's yeah, yeah. innovations yeah. in in uh, how you know he used time and yeah. and how he got there. I'm probably too old to understand. I did read the book, which was a great book by Dan yeah. Charnas, but um, he was like, "Hey man, can you play this like super behind the beat?" Uh -huh. I was like, ah, "What? I can try, but it's not. I can't get there." And so what we did was really just straight up how I was playing it, just really kind uh -huh. of straight. And uh, later on, this record came out. And a friend of mine who heard it, he goes, man, you, I, I, he used, you know, you know, more colorful language, but he was like, man, they really messed your ish up on that record. You should hear it. It sounds terrible, man. <laughs> yeah, I would be mad if I were you. <laughs> it's like they slowed down your guitar or what? Well, I think they, no, I don't think they, I think what Russ did was, yeah, he, it's cool. I mean, he pulled it back a little bit mm. and uh, just the relation to the drums. Yeah. I, I don't really know exactly. Because I read stuff about like Questlove saying that he couldn't, like like that time feel that he had to develop for yeah, the, for yeah. voodoo like was hard to undo like it took a while to learn yeah. it. it's like those people that that do like science experiments where they see everything upside down and then like their eyes actually flip and then they had a whoa they that's gotta, terrifying <laughs> that's terrifying i don't want to be their friend yeah no. so uh yeah it seemed like he uh he had said that there was yeah like a, a time feel that they were going for and that kind of like that flam you know kind of it's quite thing. yeah i think that's what they were kind of going but it was more it's more my friend ella Feingold, who's a brilliant guitar player, was she? She's who connected us. Yeah, oh, she did. Yeah. Oh, great, great. Yeah. So Shout she, out to Ella. she has his MPC, or she had access to maybe the Dilla MPC, and she was explaining to me pretty much his concept and how yeah. he, and it's kind of brilliant, yeah. you know. And and it's really, it reminds me a lot of um, like your Ruben drum, like three drum, and yeah. and um, you know, clave music. Yep, just the way that everyone in the group is so their time is so deep and the feel is so deep that they can really stretch out phrases yeah. and do stuff like that because everyone really knows where the one is yeah in such a deep way yeah. so i think it comes from that at least that's what i feel like it comes from well it's yeah. it's brilliant it's brilliant work and and uh, those are two of my favorite songs on the record oh, cool. and and you know you're in high regard if the only you know other guitar player uh, of name is is Spanky Alfred. You know, it's like that's a rarefied air. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, um, he was a man. So, man, just thank you for that contribution hey, to music and and my uh, very formative in in my guitar taste and the way that I approach guitar. So, uh, thank you oh, right for, for me and everybody else out there oh, who shoot. took inspiration from that. Even though you didn't really listen to, it. I get that's the unbelievable. Part. Only reason I listen to it is because people are like, man, you should, you know, you're this record. <laughs> It's because of young people, my kids' age, people my yeah. kids' age are like, wow, that record is, yeah. you know, I, I guess, you know, it's the ripples in a stream. It takes a minute for it to yeah. reach the shore, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, history, time always does things with art and music. Yeah. It, 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 The perspective, the lens gets distorted or maybe it's distorted just right so you yeah. can look at it the way yeah. it needs to be looked at. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I want to uh, move on from D'Angelo. Okay. And I want to move on to fast forward to 2006. Okay. And the work that you did with John Mayer. Okay. And you had a song that you did with him called In Repair. Okay. And uh, he's even made a documentary about it back yeah, in yeah. that time. I think it's called <laughs> One One Day, One Song, or One Song, One Day, or something like that, where it looked like it was at Avatar. Yeah, it was and, at Avatar. Yeah. And... Um, and you, I guess this was like a... There's a, there's a quote that he he gave or that he he said i want to read it to you he said uh one of the moments in the song that makes it different than most songs i've written is that charlie hunter wrote the bridge section himself it was just kind of his sensibility in that song and that's a 
an excerpt from the documentary. Oh, that's nice. Um, I wish had, I... You, had you heard him say that, or did you? you no, really I didn't. <laughs> no, no. Uh. Uh-uh. So do you do you remember much about the the session, the the song, any anything remarkable? Man, I just remember I was just having trouble with my instrument at that point. There's a still the eight, eight strings. Still yeah, playing. yeah. I think it was, or maybe it was. I was only playing. I turned it into a seven. I can't remember, but um, yeah. So I was just maybe just trying to do that. But it ended up being pretty cool. I think the track, right? Yeah. There's some I interesting stuff it. on it where <laughs> I think there's like I don't know if you were using the pog. Somebody was using a pog. He was the okay. thing that does the, the poly octave. Uh, it, it, it's very metallic, but it gives yeah. like a kind of a almost like a church organy kind of yeah. sound to it yeah yeah and then do you remember like obviously he's he said you brought so, something special to the to the mix do you remember like kind of like the part that you came up with is it just kind of listening to how the song was materialized or how written was it when you got there i not written at all he we just did this thing he came up with it. i think we were just grooving and right but just doing a thing and putting little chord changes i can't remember i gotta be honest was steve jordan playing the drums oh yeah, yeah okay. oh yeah it's yeah. incredible that guy yeah so what was that like like working with him? oh man it was my first time working with him and it was i mean he's steve jordan what, what can you right. say you know what i mean rock like yeah. rock solid man it was education and do you remember gear wise like what kind of amp you were using or was it direct or <sighs> probably was direct i would imagine yeah you think john may would have let you go direct you don't think he would have thrown a dumbbell in there for you <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, I've never played through a Dumble before, and um, I'm not a super gear guy, yeah, as yeah. you can see, other than these crazy guitars. Yeah. But um, he had a Marshall stack there. Really? And I had never played through one before, yeah. and I, and you're gonna laugh at me, but I really loved that group ACDC. Yeah. And I was, and I'd never had a chance to play anything yeah. like that before. Yeah. And he had like a guitar with like the I don't maybe it was an SG I think it was yeah, yeah. it's like bro, can I please like play for like just a minute or two? Yeah. Man, I must have played for just a like burn one of their licks or yeah. something, and it was so loud and it moved so much air that I had to stop. Like I was terrified. It was just like this. <laughs> this is not for me. But thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. You know. That's great. That's great. Was that the first time that you'd work with him? Like that, that on that session, or had you done anything with him before? I hadn't worked with him, but you know, he was. He's um, a big fan of yours. Yeah, he's always been very kind to me, and and um, he came to one of my gigs when he was very young, probably uh-huh. in his early 20s. Before um, he had a record deal? or Oh, yeah, before that. And then when he got a record deal, I think it was his first record, then he started playing. I had a band with this great drummer, Stephen Chopek, and, and um, he hired Stephen to play in his mm-hmm. band mm-hmm. at that point. Um, and the, fun, the funny thing is my son, when he was about 10, he came into the house like from i don't know he's probably coming from baseball practice or something like that and he came to the house all excited he goes dad dad i just heard someone do you better than you and it was that song uh he does Neon? yes yeah yeah and um it's really good man like i heard him do a solo show on acoustic guitar yeah and that was my favorite thing uh uh-huh that he's done by yeah, far yeah. like i just loved the the like he really has a great feel and of course a great songwriter and then all of the interplay between the voice and playing guitar i mean that's hard stuff yeah. to do you yeah know what i mean absolutely so, anyway yeah it's a it's a difficult skill i mean you have to have a lot of markers to kind of like make sure that you're staying on track with doing you know that busy of a guitar part and singing yeah, you know, and yeah. checkpoints throughout yeah your it's years. great it's great man really really great but this is the first time you've like been in the studio with him in yeah. a professional context yeah. okay yeah it, i'm wondering i know that this guitar is not yeah. capable of doing some of the stuff that that uh, that eight string was doing that you used there but i'm yeah. wondering if we could maybe listen to it sure and then you know you have you haven't listened to this in some time or air in its completion at all so this will be made in voyage so we have a, a track okay. we've pulled out the vocal just so we can focus on the instrumentation okay so yeah you bet if if i'm going to be grimacing at my playing uh, i'll just uh, prepare you for that yeah well let, let us know because <laughs> it, it'll be interesting i mean some parts are obviously him there's some solo parts yeah, that are yeah, very john yeah. mayer you know stylistically but you know like i love okay, to get your impressions sure. as it's going sure so let's, sure, let's, let's, sure. let's cue it up
We will get back to the interview with Charlie in just a moment, but I wanted to take a quick second to talk about one of the sponsors that makes these interviews possible. That's our friends over at Sweetwater in their brand new program, the Sweetwater Gear Exchange, which is an amazing way to be able to buy and sell used gear. And one of the great things about the gear exchange is that you get to keep 100% of your earnings as a seller, no more seller fees, so long as you want to take your earnings and put them on a Sweetwater gift card. And if you're somebody like me who's always buying gear at Sweetwater, it's a great way to maintain 100% of your earnings as a seller and be able to put that toward gear you might be buying anyway. Check them out over at sweetwater.com slash use. You can start an account and start buying and selling. So that's him. That's him, I think, that's yeah. Him. With the pog. Then. Pretty sure that's what yeah. I'm doing. Yeah. With a tremolo. Tremolo like on the guitar. But I had this note on the guitar, it's on the bass now. On this instrument. Right? Whatever. Wrong note, but. really don't know this song. <laughs> well, we can get the, the bridge part that, that, that's this supposedly the bridge now? Uh, should be coming up here. Does this feel like a Charlie Hunter sensibility as you're hearing it back? Uh, not really. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. This is kind of like the chorus. But you, so you've never listened to the complete, uh, like the like the completed product. No, I have not. This is the first this time. Is the first time. Maiden voyage. Maiden voyage. But I did remember that he was using that the pog that thing, and I was like, wow, because I guess it was something that was relatively new. Yeah, they were he, they were huge back then. They've since consolidated Got it you. into like smaller. I was like, wow, that's version. cool. I remember he was just messing around with it, and he's like, let's do the tune with this. I'm like, all right. And then the acoustic guitar. I remember uh, my friend Jeff Trougott. He said, man, if you're playing that session, take this guitar, acoustic guitar to him. Okay. And I'm pretty sure that's the acoustic guitar he played on, okay. the, on the session with okay. that, that one. Not his Martin OM-28 No, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, this was a, probably a while ago, yeah, so yeah. I don't know. I don't want to step on anyone's toes. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Well, still, a very cool song, and uh, I, it's cool that we got to experience your reaction ah, to it. Yeah. Having heard it, and it's, you know, albeit, you know, almost uh, 20 years, or, yeah. or 17 years I mean, later. I think I know the song now. If we listen to it again, I can... Play it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't want to. We don't need to put any pressure on you. Play. Oh, I was, I was more okay. curious as to like, yeah, like your your thoughts and kind of hearing oh. it retrospectively as to how it how it felt in 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 the mindset and the context of the session. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't remember too too much, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, I we've spent some time going through other people's music, D'Angelo, yeah, yeah, John Mayer. I want to spend some time on your music and oh, some okay. stuff that I really love. Oh, okay. Um, and one of the coolest things that that's just really blown me away, just in terms of the groove and, and just the just the quality of the music and the whole vibe, is the stuff that you've done with Dion Ferris. Oh, wow! Oh, uh, wow! That's great. And uh, you guys did a really awesome cover of Always Something There to Remind Me. Right, right. That and Bert Bacharach song, I right, think, right. And, uh, well, I don't know if he, did he write the, did he write I that? I think he did. Even I, though it was like an 80s jam. Yeah, the original version of it is Dion Fer uh Dion, not Dion Ferris, but Dion Warwick was the original Dion Warwick did, did it, and then it, and then it was covered again in the in the eighties by. Uh, was it Dion Warwick? I think so. Is it, let's let's look it up. Al David and Bert Bacharach. Yeah. Wow. Holy smoke! So yeah. Now I mean I only know D I only knew Dion from like. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I only I knew her from like uh, I can't remember what the songs. Da, 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 oh yeah, I know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. has like the slide guitar. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. We know each other 
because we were really young. I mean, we were in our early 20s when I was in that group, Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy, mm. and yep. she was in that group, Arrested Development. Mm. And we were on like a big uh, kind of tour, package mm. tour with another group or two for a while. Mm -hmm. Probably must have been, I don't know, 1990, mm -hmm. 91 maybe? -ish. Yeah. And so we were kind of the music heads yeah. on that tour. Um, she, myself, and Simone White, the drummer, mm -hmm. we would hang out a lot. And, yeah. Um, so anyway, as to, we just reconnected later yeah. on and made this record. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's been a good 10, 12 years since yeah. we made it. I, I can't remember. Yeah. That, but well, I think I think the the release I have here was in uh, 2014. Okay. Presumably, you recorded it before then. Yeah, probably so. Yeah. Yeah. But the groove on it. Is insane, and oh. so I'm wondering uh, if you could play a little bit of that. We get a taste of, of yeah. Some, I mean, the only reason I remembered it was just like, and it was on a seven string. Okay. So I had an extra higher string that I don't have, but I mean, a, a, you know, kind of like a facsimile would be just something like something like that, right? Yeah. Something like that. Yep. Something like that. Right. Right. Something like yep. that. Something like it. Yeah. did listen to that uh, this morning just to make sure I knew the yeah. chord changes or some and I was just struck by how I want to give her props I was just struck by how great Dion's phrasing is yeah just like phrasing just for days yeah I mean, she's an incredible jazz singer so I, in the pocket yeah you know I didn't I didn't really know I mean like obviously as I said I knew yeah. like sort of the pop version uh, of of you know her performances but i didn't know yeah like she's really like super gifted singer. oh she's I got mean, a lot she's got you know, a it's, it's more than just time. the tone you know i mean like yeah. he's yeah I, yeah I agree and she plays a lot with my friends in butcher brown as well as with russell gunn i don't know if you're familiar with mm -hmm. russell gunn great trumpet player yep and i think he's got a great a band down in atlanta um, yeah yeah, well, she she's incredible. That album's got some really really cool stuff, and it's just it's just a two year. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. You know. Yeah, it didn't even make sense to use a track on this one because Re every, everything's right here. Recession. <laughs> it was a recession era thing. It was. Know? It's a it's a beautiful record. I highly oh, recommend people you. check it out. We will also include this in the uh, description if people want to check out some of this stuff. All sure, the stuff we're playing today, sure. so that people can find it on their own. 
Uh, and where was that recorded? That was, oh, you know, that was recorded at the Bunker in Brooklyn. Okay. Yeah. All right. And that's when you were still located in... In, in Jersey. When okay, I was in, in Jersey. Jersey, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And was that just done over a couple of days, or was it just... I'd imagine it was probably one day. Yeah? So yeah. It's went straight through. I pretty sure, I would imagine yeah. we probably just Lean did it Lean and mean, man. Yeah, okay. saving money, you know. Yeah, I got that. I got that. Well, let's talk about one more song. Okay. And it's, a, it's an Al Jarreau okay. cover. Okay. That you did with Kurt Elling, yeah, um, and, and, and Nate Smith, and the great Nate Smith on drums, uh, who is uh, man, just it, it just has, has got some incredible momentum over, you know, just continues over the last oh, yeah. uh, few years here. And, and but he's been, yeah, he's been doing it forever. He didn't go anywhere. He was always doing it. But I'm glad that he's. Yeah, he's, I think that you know certainly like the Wolfpack connection helped. You yeah, know, uh, yeah. And his band. It is great kinfolk if mm -hmm. you haven't heard that yeah. great band and great compositions and arrangements uh, spring arrangements which nate does all that stuff. he does all of it oh yeah so he's more than just a drummer <laughs> <laughs> aren't we all right well uh i'm wondering if uh firstly i mean the kurt Elling stuff is really it's it's got some some good number of plays on there seeing people seem to really connect with it yeah how did you make the connection with with uh, he and nate well, so Kurt and I, we started right after the pandemic doing a bunch of stuff. Um, and we have a, a thing called Super Blue we mm -hmm. do um, where, uh, you know, we recorded a bunch with um, um, DJ Harrison and Corey Fonville mm -hmm. from Butcher Brown. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have two records out with that. And then we do this thing called Guilty Pleasures where we just do an, did an EP. Yeah with uh, me, Nate, and Kurt, because uh, we were in the same town at the same time. Yep. So we just figured, oh, let's just go into the studio and yeah. whip some of these things yeah. out. Uh, and so that's happened. But it's kind of like a, an ecosystem, the whole Super Blue thing. We tour a lot with um, Kenny Banks Jr. on mm. keys, a great keyboard mm. player. Um, sometimes um, Julius Rodriguez, amazing. And uh, of course, DJ Harrison, who's yeah. just one of my favorite guys. And uh, Marcus Finney, uh, Nashville bass yep. drummer from Memphis. That's my guy. We yeah. we tour like yeah. crazy. We have a great kind of connection with that nice. music now, which is just fun every night. Just uh, don't want to let him down. Yeah. I want yeah. <laughs> Well, it's in so the guilty pleasures with this is this this is off this record. Yeah, it's it's all kind of like covers. Total, yeah, but, covers but of, that Kurt dug when yeah. he was, uh, you know, coming up. Or so that whatever. so Al Jarreau was one of his oh, guilty he loved pleasures. Al yeah, yeah, he and loved this song. Uh, from from the we're in Le this love together. Uh, is that was, what it's from? Well, that was that was you know another popular oh, Al Jarreau song. Sure, or, sure, uh, definitely. Morning is yeah, another big yeah. one. Um, but yeah, amazing stuff. Aldro also just a gifted singer. But I, I would love to hear your interpretation of Boogie sure. Down. We it's got the track me here. Trying not to 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 let you know. Trying to keep up with Nate. All right. Well, let's <laughs> let's see let's see if we can do it. And uh, yeah, take us to the promised land. Charlie. All righty. <laughs> So Charlie, yes, sir. We've spoken about your work with D'Angelo, your work with John Mayer, your work with Dion Ferris, your work with Kurt Elling and Nate Smith. But now I want to ask you some questions and okay. some stories okay. that I'd like to hear from you All right. about times in your career, 
about gear that you've used historically. And as you may notice behind us, there <laughs> magically has appeared a Hughes and Kettner tube rotosphere. This is an item with which you were very much associated for the early part of your career. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about how this came to be as part of the signature sound of a certain era of Charlie Hunter Oh music. my God. Well, I mean, it's funny to hear it because I haven't heard one of these in 15, 20 years. I mean, but you forget like, if you could click in between slow and fast. Okay, so you're slow. And then back to fast. It's really still the best sounding one of these It things. is the best sounding one. Why? Analog. It's really great. There's a 12AX7 in the middle. You can kind of see it through the yeah. screen. Maybe we get zoom in on that, uh, you know, for, for the post-production so people can see very clearly that it does yeah. have a 12AX7 that appears to be working. The voltage is bizarre. It's, it's uh, AC power, 12 volts, I think wow. 700 milliamps. So it's still relatively so it's pushing unfriendly. the tube. Presumably, I mean, there's I, enough voltage in there. For presumably, to you make could it get, do something. You could get right? enough voltage out of that to 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 make it do something that's not just a glorified LED. It's, it's it not is just on some pedals. It's not just window dressing. Yeah. Right. Literally, there's a window. Well, I'll tell you what. This pedal, I remember. I don't have one. I must have given mine to somebody. I can't remember because I didn't sell it. I don't have it anymore. Um, but like I was telling you before, like. The first thing I used, because I was really, I, when I first started this, I didn't have a lot of other than like, you know, Joe Pass, Tuck Andrus that were doing that kind of stuff on a guitar. My, the, the people that I like listened to were organ players and, mm -hmm. you know, doing the bass and the chords and whatnot. So, you know, and then having, getting the ability to have this organ kind of Leslie sound on top allowed me to, to get away with a lot of, a lot of stuff, you know, like you would just have that. Like, it would move, it would move. When you're just playing a chord. You know, it would allow you to do all those things, and there was like a little subtext going on, so you could kind of get away with a lot of stuff. But what ended up, this was big and it was heavy, and you know, I mean, in the 90s, I didn't have like a pedal board. Yep. I had one at some point, but I just had this, and like I was telling you, like the big old volume pedal. Yep, the Ernie Ball. And that I would just put in my suitcase, yep. you know, wrap it in like a jacket or something yeah. and that was it yeah. that was how we rolled um and um but then i got the plastic one the plastic yeah, the boss yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah exactly so um but man i'm su just surprised at how great it sounds i yeah. gotta be honest man yeah. and this one's not that that noisy some of them can get oh, kind of noisy mine and I, I did go through this though i should say that you, you did yeah yeah to okay. make it you know a little quieter so mine was the problem with it was it was just like half leslie and half <laughs> it got pretty hissy. Yeah. So, I mean, explain to me from your engineering standpoint what's going on here. I've always been interested. Well, I mean, it, they're they're doing sort of a, a replication. I think that the preamp section is somewhat similar to what you would find in like a Leslie, and okay. then obviously they're kind of using like a, a chorus type circuit to yeah. try to emulate what the the Leslie effect would be right. doing in the rotation. Right. But you know, this is a. I mean, a, a for its time, it was super groundbreaking, and there really wasn't anything that I don't think's rivaled it, other than the Mark II, which is very similar to this. Uh, and also, I think the same enclosure potentially, um, but yeah. subsequently everything else has been digital. digital. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And not to say that you can't get a cool sound, but 
there's a certain vibe that this has. Oh no, that, this that, has got the vibe I completely forgot about. Yeah, if you're an analog, you know, pervert, and yeah. you want the true sound of the Leslie, I mean, this is this is still yeah. what you get. You know, Warren Haynes still uses these. I mean, the guys that are disciples of it are are still using That's it. So funny because I just gave mine to someone. I can't remember who I gave it to. So maybe we uh, do a GoFundMe for the two brothers. No, again. no, it's okay. <laughs> I'm okay. But you know, I remember now that we're talking about this. I just had a something came through my middle-aged fog but i remember buying this in about 1998 maybe okay. does that sound about right maybe 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 a little early earlier i don't know i don't know when it came out maybe, and maybe i right. got it at um making music in, oh, chicago. in chicago yeah and i got this it used to be in la it did okay i got that and i got this little analog delay pedal aquapus Oh yeah, they're hugely expensive now too. And I and I mean, I bought both of those things at the same time, and I was just a touring musician. Yeah. I didn't have money, so they well, these were still been. pretty expensive back. They then. They were back yeah. then, but yeah. I think I plugged in. I heard it, and I, at the time, I was using a um, like I told you earlier, a Mutron yeah. three knob the phaser, yeah, the six stage, you're... which I got in probably 1990 at Black Market Music yeah. on um, in San Francisco. Yeah, back then yeah. from Bill Charman. Yeah, yeah but. Uh, but that thing, it has a K, you know, it plugs directly into the walls. Yeah, wall yeah it has an AC cord. Yeah. yeah, and I gave that to DJ Harrison and Butcher Brown. Okay. He plays his roads through it. I'm yep. just like, that's a good use right. of that pedal. Yeah. You know. Yeah, well, you still sound amazing on it. Oh, thanks, uh, man. And yeah, it's got, and, and did you always run it in mono? I know there's, it sounds better in stereo, but were you always. Oh, man, mono? no, I never. I mean, I already had to bring a damn bass amp with right. me as well as a guitar amp, so no, no stereo. It's always mono. I don't like, I gotta be honest, I don't like that stereo very, stereo guitar. I like the idea of it. Right. But every time I've played it or heard it, I always just feel like this is just messing up the time. Yeah. It's messing up the time feel for me. Okay. You know? But, uh, but you could definitely, I think if you did it, you can get the high and the low in different yeah. places, right? Yeah. Which is not such a bad idea, yeah. really. I guess yeah. if you you have that, but I never did it yeah. that way. Well, it, it's just cool to hear here. Kind Thanks of, for bringing like, it. The, yeah, I thought we'd bring this uh, yeah. blast from the past. Well, another thing that I wanted to ask you about uh, is you know it kind of goes back to to the time that this was in use. Uh, I want to show you a video of yourself. This I think was in the year two thousand. You were using an eight string guitar at the okay. time, and this is around the first time that I I saw you first at Yoshi's in Oakland, okay. and it was probably around two thousand. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and uh, and and you played not. I think this was in San Juan Capistrano, but and so this isn't one that I was at. But you, I remember you played this song, A Closer Walk With Thee. Okay. Uh, and uh, I want to just play it for you. I want to get your impressions of uh, you know maybe you've seen this recently. Uh, and uh, I know it's going to be too many notes, and the time is right. not going to be as good as I'd like it well, to be. Well, let's see what you think. Here it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can see I'm struggling with the instrument right off the bat. Yeah, I don't like it. Just, just because it's, it's, I understand. That thing sounds great. It sounds great. <laughs> but you know what the issue is? I had the music in me, but I think I made a mistake in starting with the eight string. And the reason I started with the eight string was because it was just a like a reptile brain decision. Because yeah. I was like, well... I want something that looks like a bass and a guitar. Yeah. And I don't want to have to look at a chart, like a chord chart, and have to deal with, yeah. like, and then, but what ended up happening is eight strings is a lot to fit on a neck. It get They're very tight. Yeah. And I realized, like, I don't, I've got some big kind of sausage fingers, like, wait a minute, now I have to work on this, and yeah. how am I... And then I wasn't even like planning on having like a career with it. I just built it as the head Ralph Novak who who developed the whole fan fret system. Yeah. Um, and for that we are all thankful. It's what yeah. we use at hybrid guitars yeah. and and I mean yeah. it's really he really did a mitzvah for yeah. the universe with that. Right. But um it was also I was putting him in a position where I was just like, okay, build something completely crazy 
And it had a lot of issues because how are you going to ask someone like off the bat, build this and, and make it work? But um, also when you have that much tension, I think I was using 14s on the mm -hmm. guitar, mm -hmm. like very heavy strings. Yes. You have that much tension on a neck with that many strings and the bass is short scale. Yeah. Number one, it's really hard to get your intonation yeah. like on. Number two, it's, it's so tight, things are together. I mean, I think my bass was like a 110 or something yeah. like that, flat wound. Yeah. Uh, and it's just like, it was really tight in there and yeah. hard to navigate it. Um, and uh, But, you know, I still was coming from guitar. I mean, I got, I think I got the eight string in 94. So if that's 2000, I had been playing it for six years at that yeah. point, you know, and um, definitely not 10,000 hours yet. Yeah. And I think for that, it's pretty damn good. I yeah. mean, I could get around on the guitar without a lot yeah, of Yeah, I mean, problem. it looks incredibly challenging. Just looking at it, it looks daunting. It was very challenging. Um, and it's just, you know, it was just, you know, I just ended up with a career. And before I knew it, I was just like, whoa, this instrument is really yeah. hard. Yeah. And, now, and then so as time went by, I just kept put getting into and and as you get older and you become a better musician hopefully I'm always working on this stuff mm -hmm. you're playing less and less stuff yeah. and it's more and more quality what you're yeah. playing and I got more and more interested in the stuff that doesn't impress people yeah. no no fast runs I got more and more interested in the feel and how I can make a band sound better yeah. what I can do to to maybe you know uh keep the time in a good mm. place or what whatever it yeah. may be and playing less stuff and then the most important thing is not the independence it's the interdependence mm -hmm. you know so instead of like just like think about well wait thinking about that quarter note you know Because there's so much more actual information right. in that right. than there was in all that fast stuff. Because yeah. all that fast stuff, you're fudging and you're doing this and you're doing that. Yeah. You know, so and it's all great. Yeah. It's just it's just how you you yeah, the evolution. What your approach is and how you you yeah. evolve the instrument. You know, yeah. and also the big difference is, you know, Ralph was doing what he could with the technology that was available at the time. Yeah. And hats off to him because he brought us, he got us in the game yeah. with this kind of thing. Yeah. But, you know, this hybrid company that, you know, full uh, disclosure, I'm but part owner of yeah. the company. Yeah. Uh, it's also, it, we, they made in the pre-war guitars yep. factory in Hillsborough, North Carolina. All of the years that I had with Ralph helping me develop stuff and then Jeff Trow got later help mm. helping me develop and me coming up with okay this is how it should sound yeah well to get with the hybrid guys who have a CNC machine a computer etc right. etc we're like okay let's try this let's try this let's yeah. try this go through all these iterations what's the perfect scale length yeah. situation what is the perfect taper what's the perfect neck yeah. width what is how do we get these pickups to work correctly etc etc yeah. etc yeah. well the last thing I want to ask you about, Charlie, sure. uh, and you kind of alluded to this a, a bit when you said that your son had come to you and said, there's a guy that's playing you better than oh, you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I wanted to, to know if you ever had a reaction or saw this, but it's it's the album cover to John Mayer's first album, which is Room for Squares. And you can see back there that oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. the inspiration... Uh, I think from you uh, materialized into one of these guitars uh, made by Ralph Novak right. being put in in the uh, the album cover, which I don't know, you know, whether people just assumed it was some sort of strat or something like that, or had any connection. Yeah, oh, that's so funny. But he he also wrote something. Those were great guitars, the ones Ralph. He made like strats and tellies like uh -huh. that, and and they were. He was telling me he's like, this is really kind of what I do. This, yeah. check this out, you know. So he was interviewed by like a, a fan forum th okay. that uh, where they would you know ask him questions and he'd do like I guess a Q and A for them, and he said in terms of people that I listen to, there are definitely records you can pick up where you can hear me ripping off, such as Charlie Hunter. Oh. He's one of my favorite musicians and he's oh, a jazz kind. guy. 
He plays a really innovative guitar in eight string. He plays the guitar and bass at the same time, and it's very, very cool. I'm completely inspired by oh, him. Oh, that's so nice. you can see where you know, obviously neon. You know, he's, yeah, he's self admitting yeah, yeah. ripped off the style and used the the Novax guitar in order to pull it off, presumably on the record. Uh, and you yeah. know, obviously he played I, acoustically too. And I, I just don't see it as ripping off because <laughs> I heard that neon. I was like, this is some badass shit. Yeah. Pardon me, but it, but this is great. And I love this. And I'm like, if uh, we're just all little tiny, tiny links yeah. on this massive chain. Yeah. And it's such an honor to even be able to get up in the morning and practice on an instrument yeah. and to say, Man, boy, it's it's an honor to just be in this game at all. Yeah, you know what I mean, and and to play with these great musicians and to to contribute. Yeah. So I just see it as like, well, if you if you're quote unquote ripping me off, number one, why would you rip rip me off? There's no market for it. Right. There's no resale value <laughs> for one. You know. And yeah. the other thing is is it's um no he it's an I'm informed by Joe Pass, Blind Blake. Uh, I mean, James Jamerson, I can go on and on and on for right. hours of the people I'm informed by. And, yeah. and, and those are just the people that I listen to. I'm mm -hmm. not to, not to mention all the people I've played with. Mm -hmm. Everyone you play with is influencing you and you're learning yeah. from them. So we're just all part of this thing. And it's just a game of telephone. We play with yeah. one another. Yeah. And uh, I'm honored that someone that, that does what he does at his yeah. level would be like, oh man, this, I really like this. You yeah, know, no, I, I, think it's, I think it's really important. I, mean, I think that he was probably, from interviews like that is what turned me on to you. And it just turned out that like, at the time you were, I think it, it living or based in Berkeley. Okay. And I was going to college in Berkeley. And, okay. you know, so I could see that you were playing around locally and I could, I could go and oh, find yeah. it. So it just kind of turned out, it was like, oh cool, this guy Charlie Hunter, oh, he's, wow, that's he's local, funny. you know? Um, so I, you know, I think that, uh, certainly he probably turned on a lot of people to what it is. That I you're appreciate doing. it. Um, but Charlie, I'm just really thankful and grateful that you would agree to, uh, be interviewed by me today and to talk about some of these songs from the past, some of the gear with which oh, right on, you were man. known for in the past and even play a little bit of it for us. Oh, uh, it's I, my I, pleasure. And, uh, I just can't thank you enough for everything you've done thank for you. music and, oh, man, uh, for guitar you. players. So. I, I just, me. I'm just so appreciative, and I'm wondering, as a special treat, if you'd be willing to play us a little something, maybe even using the rotosphere here. Sure, just to but kind you of have to out. you have to push the slow and the fast speed. Okay, well, whenever you feel like. Pushing okay, well, it. give me the cue. Whenever you want, you get to decide. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> 